<laughs> yeah, just the people working with us. Yeah, I'm getting to know a lot of you now. You're coming coming to these things. It feels like old home week in a in a way, and it's it's a nice. We got the fire going. Uh, we got the you know the refreshments, and we got the couch. That's Bernard's spot right there, and and uh, so so in a way, this is you know we wanted to set this up so that almost like we're sitting, you know, in a living room talking about uh, some of these things. So uh, with a microphone, with a microphone, yeah, yeah. Um, so welcome, I appreciate you coming. Uh, as some of you know, we've been doing a series of these talks, and um, it started out as the, the talks were. The first four were, uh, you know, when it comes to home ownership, uh, there are no stupid questions. The only stupid questions are the ones you're afraid to ask. So we we kind of shifted that title just a little bit for tonight. And, you know, the title is, um, you know, when it comes to downsizing, there are no stupid questions, uh, only the ones you're afraid to ask. So uh, as those of you, how many people might occasionally read my Column and, and uh, oh my god, love your cup, 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 cup <laughs> one runneth over. Thank you, thank you for reading. We've got the whole entire readership of the Sentinel in this in this room right now. And and does anybody want to take the moment to complain about the size of the font? Oh come on, the, the, the size of the font in, in the Sentinel. It's, you know. We're, you know, I, I'm going to have a contest soon where I give away those uh, reading magnifying uh, things so you can keep reading. Um, but I, I think I think you know if you've been a reader of the column that, that, you know, tonight's, you know, the next couple of weeks topics are one that's kind of near and dear to my heart and uh, I've been talking about for a while now. So I, I appreciate that it resonates with, with some of you. But... Without further ado, oh, I do want to thank uh, Dax Nolenberger, who's our uh, all tech man here, because he's a millennial and he's the only one of us that knows how to work any of this uh, stuff. We've got Marika Strauss in the back, and uh, you know, we're thankful to have her as part of our team, and Natasha Mingay um, here at the front door, who is the jack of all trades and the master of all trades at the same time. And then I, I want to uh, introduce uh, my wife, Terry Bresney, uh, who's going to kind of give us an uh, introduction to, to the topic, to what we're going to be talking about tonight. So uh, I can say a lot about her, which... But don't. Don't? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let me, let me give the mic to her then and then let her take it away. Hi, everybody. He'll talk about all my past careers that led me to this. Um, so tonight's a little different, and I promise we will get to the, the technical stuff, taxes and all that stuff that's easy to think about. Tonight is really going to be more about the squishy stuff, the stuff that we really don't like thinking about, which is aging and change. Two things that are high on everyone's list, right? Most of us hate change, and getting older is not exciting. But it's the one thing left in our culture that we all have in common, that we can't argue about, that's happening to everybody the same. I mean, you may age differently, but there's no escaping the fact that you're on a continuum and you started as a baby and you came through and here we are and you've got life changes that um, you just can't outthink it. You, but, but what Tom and I have realized in talking to people in their homes is they really are good at denial. <laughs> and so what we kind of want to do is unpack that and see why is that? You know, what is it about getting older that just sets our hair on fire that we, we don't want to think about? And the frontier for this process, what we were hoping to gather from you guys and have you participate, to be the people that help us create a map for how to age better. The, the millennials have done a great job with retirement. When I, when I was growing up, I didn't think about retirement in my 20s or 30s. It was the last thing on my mind. I was traveling or doing what I was doing. These guys in their 30s now all have savings accounts for their kids. They've got 401ks. They've got a, an equity portfolio because they've been educated culturally. They've learned and changed that this is what I need to do to be a responsible adult. And here we are, the responsible adults, with no plan of how to exit the planet. 
and a vague awareness that we're going to exit the planet because we don't talk about it. You don't go to a cocktail party and say, hey, let's talk about my aging. You know, I, I, that's a fun thing to talk about. So it gets closeted. So what Tom and I are hoping to do is kind of get it out of the closet and find a, a, a map, a way to tackle these things that come up in everyone's living room when we go to talk to them about their home. We don't even have a good name for this period of life. Do we call it seniorhood, olderhood, the last age, the final chap? I mean, if we can tonight determine something to call this that's a little more glamorous, that would be a win because none of those things, they don't feel right, do they? I mean, you know, nobody thinks they're getting old. There's a fuzzy awareness that things are changing, but I've, I've never talked to anyone who feels their age. They feel exactly like they did in their 20s, 30s, 40s in their mind. They may be a little slower to pivot. They may have some achy wrists. Maybe they can't lift that same FedEx box but they don't feel dispirited at all. So the odd thing is we spend our entire life preparing. We prepare as babies. Babies prepare for the physical world by learning to navigate in their bodies. They prepare you in elementary school. You're preparing to go to high school. High school, you learn some more skills and you're preparing to go to college. Then you have a set of preparations to get a career. And all of that is we're preparing. That's what we know to do, prepare for the next thing, to have a career, to make a living, to earn your way in the world. And then all of a sudden, we get to our 50s, and the kids are hopefully off and on their own, and there's a tiny awareness that things are changing in our bodies and in our, our aspirations. And you lay in bed and you do the math, 50. Okay, let's see, if I live to be 100, I've got 50 more summers. Let's see, maybe I did the math wrong. And then you go over it again, and if, and there's no getting around it. You're in the middle of your life, and suddenly you think, well, what am I, what am I going to do with this rest of this life? But the kids still need you. You're traveling. You can still wield that chainsaw. You can get up on the ladder and trim the wisteria. So it gets the can gets kicked down the road because you still feel pretty good. Then you hit your 60s, and you think, oh, okay, I'm 60. You do the math again. Okay, if I live to be 100, I'm 60. I've got, okay, I've got four, about 40 years. And then maybe your parents get sick. And then you're a caregiver to your parents in their 80s and 70s, 80s and 90s. And then that really brings it home because you're looking at faces and bodies that look familiar. You're caring for people. You see how they did or didn't prepare properly. And so that's that's another giant awareness that, oh, okay, I cannot escape this. I'm, I'm mortal. And how do I want to pass out of this world? So um, it's also become clear to us that not everybody has a good succession plan. They don't have all their little ducks in a row. So we sit in people's living rooms and ask them questions. You know, they, they're deciding whether to move or to downsize. And they're really ill prepared because there's nowhere to go to ask. Your your financial advisor will give you a certain set of information, but it's not complete. You don't want to go to your psychologist and say, I'm we're kind of bummed out, I'm aging. You say, well, we'll get over it. We're all aging. So you don't get any relief or support there. If you go to the doctor, you get the 15 minutes with his eyes looking at the chart, you know, and you're trying to explain something and they brush you off and say, Well, you know, you're getting older. Next, you know, so you don't get any relief there. So we want to gather this up and get it out into the culture that there is a plan and some things you should think about and that aging is not a crime and that there is some amazing liberation in getting older and how can we kind of spread that word because there's value in being the wise elder and we want to kind of bring that to light. So Tom's going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges to accepting this. What we see over and over again is the roadblocks to, to accepting that you're at a place where you need to start to plan doesn't mean it's the end of your life, but where you want to start to get things in place. And we is it your seven challenges? No, not yet. Okay, you know where you want to go with yeah. this. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I'm going to turn it over to our wise columnist, and he's going to take us on another little journey. Thank you. I think I've messed up all of your uh, slides. Oh, I probably so jumped around. They 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 meant something. Uh, <laughs> they didn't get it. So I'm just I'm I'm gonna I want to talk about where this kind of concept came up for us. But first I I'm gonna digress really really quickly to my whiteboard over here, and um, because I think this is at the heart of everything we do, and all the ways we think about what we do for a living, which is 
it, it's a it's about home and if you think about it uh, you know the home is two two things in a very broad way it's our largest asset right so you know when it's we invest more in that than anything else in our lives and home is also um it's the it's the centering place for our lives so you know emotionally psychologically you know physically it's what holds us and nurtures us and surrounds us and it's the place that we associate with safety and comfort and security and privacy and you know all of those all of those really crucial uh, parts of, a, of quality of life for us you know it, where they all center around our homes you know it's why when we go for a long trip somewhere and we've been gone and then you you know you're coming back and you turn on to your seat your street there's a feeling for that you recognize that place you're going home you know so home is home is both of these things it's your largest asset and your and the centering place for your lives and you know both of those things are buttons our emotional buttons you know they trigger a lot of things for us as, as human beings you know they really encompass you know all the major concerns of our lives and then you know what what i noticed early on i never saw this as you know we don't we don't really sell homes we we facilitate life transitions because unless you're doing you know investment property or flipping or any of the other crap that isn't really what we do if why do people buy and sell homes because they're about life transitions that they're going through so all, all the biggest life transitions often accompany a purchase and sale of a home so it's you know you you get your first job and you go out and you want your own place so you you buy a home you you get married you know you move in together you have a home you start to have kids you you know you what do you need you need a bigger home um, you know you get a job promotion you know, all of those these life transitions revolve around home and so all of this stuff this is sort of the diagram that i use to you know to, that's that's my my centering place there when we talk about any any of these things related to home so about uh 10 years ago just as we we're coming out of the great recession uh i there was a, you know it, it was an interesting time because the inventory was really low nobody could feel figure out why people weren't selling their houses and when i started to get uh calls for people they would call me up and asked me to come over and talk about the value of their house you know they were thinking about selling so they wanted to kind of get a sense of the market and what the value of their house was so you know we get those kinds of calls all the time and i go out i make an appointment i show up and thinking that at first that we were going to talk about uh you know what is what does your zillow's estimate say about your your value you know is that accurate is it not accurate what did your neighbor's house sell for? Uh, what do you need to do to prepare your house to sell? Uh, you know, those those kinds of very specific questions about selling a home. And what I began to notice time after time again was that that wasn't the conversation at all. You know, we may start out uh, with the first question of what are you going to do to market my home? But within five or 10 minutes, we were off on a whole different kind of tran uh, tangent, which, you know, the questions were more of, uh, the discussion was more like, well, we're thinking about listing our house and, and selling it at some point in time, but we don't really know where we're going to go. And we can't really decide about this. And we're, we haven't quite retired yet, but we're going to retire soon. But uh, and when we do, then we got to figure this out. We like the idea of downsizing, but we have no idea where we'd go. And maybe we'd like to go live near our kids, but they're not settled yet. So we don't want to make a commitment there. And they'll never be able to come back and afford to live in Santa Cruz. So, but then we thought about a multi-generational place where we could all live together after we sold our house. And, you know, we'd really like something near the beach where it's very walkable and uh and you know there 
it went into all those questions. We we need a single level home. We want to be closer in because uh, we we uh, want to be closer to medical appointments and services and things. And we're kind of afraid of fires and you know, all the things that happen in, in rural uh, areas that we're getting such a dose of these days. And and so suddenly I was having those kinds of conversations on a regular basis. It wasn't about the Zillow's estimate at all or what my home is worth. And so it, it, it was like Groundhog Day. You know, I can't you know, and every every time it was that same conversation. And I started to look around and be like looking around the room here. You know, wait a minute. Everybody's about you know somewhere in and around 65 or a little north of 65. And you know, they're they're uh, you know uh, they they were talking. They were telling me about their the elderly parent who they were helping through. Uh, end of life uh, things and yet they're still got millennial kids that they're caring for um you know their their the profile began to emerge and it was so interesting there was no public conversation going on about this at all it was all these small conversations going on within people's homes between them sometimes not even between them because it was clear that spouses weren't talking together you know they were kind of they were running through scenarios in the back of their minds can i say why because neither spouse thought they were getting old yeah you know i'm not getting old maybe you're getting old but i'm not getting old yeah. you know and so talking about it would make it real and so you don't talk about it. it's like when the when the first clue is your husband says you know they're mumbling on tv a lot and you're like oh maybe you want to get your hearing checked but you don't talk about it because it's scary so the, the, you know this was a this was the conversation going on and a lot of people refer to it as as the downsizing they wanted to downsize well you know somehow that euphemism or that umbrella term of downsizing doesn't doesn't it's not really just about moving from a bigger house to a smaller house it's it's all these other things are kind of lumped under this term called downsizing and it doesn't really fit and so trying to so what was what what was this about and you know interestingly enough about 10 years ago i was 60 and uh myself and i'm starting to recognize all these things in, in our own lives which is oh my gosh i'm taking care of my elderly parent uh oh gosh i i had to get rid of all the stuff 50 years worth of accumulated stuff in their uh, garage and you know god I'll, i never want to do that to my kids uh, you know if there's any i don't want to be a burden to my kids i'm going to learn from this and i'm not going to do these things again uh when when i'm that old and, and so you know we started you know we downsized to a single level home we you know there were all these things that kind of resonated with our own lives so it, it became clear that this was this was a generation that was talking. This is the conversation that we didn't know what to call it, but that so many of us in this room probably, and so many of the people that we were talking to were having or thinking about, but kind of in the privacy of their own homes. So, um, you know, so I think we got to come clean and, you know, we're, we're aging baby boomers for the most part. I, is there anybody older than uh, 77 uh, in the room? Oh, gosh, you're older than an aging baby boomer. <laughs> so so right now, 10, 10, uh, in 2011, the first uh, uh, swath of baby boomers turned 65. Right? They were born in, in uh, 1946, right? So, you know, you know think about that that generation you know uh, you know born to people who had grown up in the depression of world war ii um you know coming out of world war ii you know where the country was poised for this huge explosion of, of growth we gi bill people went to college they were buying homes they were building levittowns all over the place we launched into the 
the largest economic expansion the world has ever known in the 50s and the 60s. We got credit cards became a thing. We we got to buy lots of lots of stuff. That's how we grew up. And um, so we're we're now uh, the largest. Uh, we, there's 73 million of us every day uh, from between now and 2029. 10,000 people are going to turn 65 a day. Uh, a day. And by uh, uh, 2034, for the first time in history, older adults are going to uh, outnumber uh, younger adults. And right now, we we control about 50% of the wealth in the in the country. So it's kind of an interesting, you know, that's you know that's the generation. Uh, you know, alternatively, we've also been uh, uh, described as being both stubborn and fearful as a as a generation. So here we are. This is this is who we are. We're embarking on this journey, and part of part of what we're all looking for is a map. Is some kind of a you know because there there hasn't been a map. There isn't one. No. No one in the history of the world has has lived as long as our generation is going to live, and there's no rules or or design for that. You know, where the culture is woefully unprepared for what we're in the middle of right now. So we have to be the role models of how to do it. There just has been no role models. It's just like the millennials, some of them had to recreate their rituals and. Um, and, and they're good at it. And I think if they can do it, we can do it. How, how many have you heard of a, this is a millennial ritual that was new? A first look. Do you all know what a first look is? Dax will know. Uh, that's when the groom decides whether to see the bride before the ceremony or not. That's a, And that's a big debate. Do you do a first look or do you see her when she's coming down the aisle? How about baby moon? You know, baby moon? Baby moon, yeah. And baby moon is you, you, that's your last honeymoon, last vacation before you have a baby. Uh, there's engagement pics that's happening. Baby bump, we all know the baby bump from every celebrity. The first section, in, sec, you know, you see that right away. How about a sip and see party? That's where you drink wine and see the new baby. Then there's a gender reveal and a diaper party, and that's for the guys. That used to be. It's the equivalent of a baby bachelor party. So if they can create all of these new rituals in one generation, I think we can map out what we want to do to be in control of the rest of our lives. Yeah, the, the interesting thing about the map is uh, it's not really a map. It starts out with uh, jigsaw pieces. So we've got a whole bunch of jigsaw pieces uh, to, to this question of designing a map and and uh you know i've got my own little list of of things here and it breaks down to kind of that the pieces are, are that's why it's so confusing and difficult to think about making a map because it's so much stuff it's complicated you know, every time you change one thing on the map another three things change along with it so it's hard to get your bearings and um so just like the home being the largest asset and the centering place for our lives, these jigsaw pieces kind of fall into those categories too. It's uh, you know on the from the pragmatic uh, silo of, of things about home and downsizing. You know we've got things like um, you know capital gains tax. So. That, that's always one of the questions. You know, what what are my capital gains taxes going to be? Prop 19. That's an obvious one. By the way, and all the, all these things that are more pragmatic and technical in nature, these are the easy things. It it takes about 10 minutes to understand Prop 19. It's it doesn't take that much longer to understand capital gains taxes, and we're we are going to go through all of that stuff too. Because the goal is to learn about each of these things in the in these silos, and then their pieces, and then start to fit together your own map using those pieces that you've learned more more about. But um, so you know things like future responsibility of being a homeowner. 
you know, there's lots of things coming down the pike that may be unexpected, you know, and if you don't, if you're not thinking about that, you know, you're, you're, you're missing a, a big piece to the puzzle and um, trust questions, estate questions, legacy questions with your children, um, healthcare, uh, what's your retirement income uh, situation? You know, a lot of people aren't thinking about that. They're talking about downsizing, but if they haven't thought about all these other things, it's they're not going to get there because it, you have to think about it all. Um, what about stuff? You know, stuff is one of the biggest aspects of that. It's it's you know on one hand it seems so simple, but it's not. It's, That's what this is about. Getting stuck. That's stuck. Yes. With your stuff. You know, on the other hand, you know, the other there's data points on the other side of the ledger, though, with with um, you know the, the home being the place that centers your lives, and you know. Well, what what does quality of life mean looking for, uh, forward? What does that mean to each of us? Uh, you know, what do people want? You know, they want more consistently, more experiences and less stuff. We hear it over and over and over again. That's a quality of life that people are seeking. Um, you know, access to care, being closer in, uh, being more connected to community, uh, being closer to family. Uh, having a single level home, uh, you know. But you, but the the challenge is that none of this can start to you can't start working through any of this until you accept that you're aging, because it's complicated. Mm -hmm. It gets overwhelming. Your eyes glaze over. You don't want to think about capital gains. You don't want to call your CPA, and so you go have a tuna sandwich, and and you wait another year and then you talk about it some more and you agree with your friends and you say oh yeah i've got this problem and that problem and yeah, i should do this and i want to do that and i really want to move close to the grandkids but i think i'll have a tuna sandwich and that's what we're trying to figure out is how can we accept that this is going to happen without fear and anxiety and just say hey i'm 60 this is the next plot point i'm going to do this in my 60s and i'm going to do this in my 70s and then when I'm 80, 90, if God willing, I'm live to be 100, it'll be peaceful. And I'll have all my, I'll have my stuff taken care of. I'll have my paperwork in a fire safe box. I've got just the amount of, right amount of clothes. And you're going to enjoy that liberated, sheer spot on where you have less responsibility. But it, all of this, if it's hanging in the back of your mind, I should, I should, I should, I should. And you don't, and you have a tuna sandwich, it's going to backfire when somebody breaks a hip has a, a serious illness or gets dementia. And so that's why we're advocates of trying to put this together now. So without stigma at 60, this is just what you do when you're 60. And this is just what you do when you're 65. So we'll keep kind of working through it until we get to a place where we say, okay, this is easy. I can do it. Always comes back to the tuna sandwich somehow. <laughs> um, so, in in working with literally hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, through the the downsize do downsize process, um, you know, there's kind of a a few I call them in, inconvenient truths that that have come up, you know, consistently time and time and time again. And you know, I I think there are, most of them are ones that we that seem obvious and we would agree with. And yet they continue to be stumbling blocks um, throughout most people's processes. It's like we know it, but we forget. And so in terms of these inconvenient truths, I think there are things that as you go through all of these aspects of uh, thinking about your assets pragmatically and also thinking about the quality of life that you want in the future, you should do it with these things ever present in in mind and you know for me watching people you know the first is there's nothing more certain than change uh, you know it doesn't that's so obvious isn't it uh, the universe is constructed that way we're all atoms there's you know every atom every microsecond is is moving it's vibrating 
That's that's how the universe is, is constructed around constant continuous change. And yet, you know, you know what it wasn't the old uh, idea of retirement for maybe our parents' uh, generation that they were going to get to 65, they were going to retire, they were going to pay off their mortgage, right? They were going to hunker down in, in the house that they'd been in for a long time, dial in all the systems, and then they wouldn't have to worry. You know, they got it all under control. You know, nothing's going to change. We're, we've got this. It's a perfect little nest that we've set up and, until things change, right? Because they always do. Um, you know, we're all on the continuum of life. You know, all of us are somewhere along that continuum, right? The, and we're all going to the same place. You know, there's no escape. We know it, right? We don't want to think about it, but we know it. You know, that's, a, that's, that's just a given. It just is. And the more we hold that present in our mind, not, not as a fearful thing, but just as a reminder thing, I think the better decision-making we'll be doing on the rest of, of the things that are part of that uh, map and that jigsaw puzzle. Uh, we can't take it with us. You know, the Egyptian pharaohs had it pretty good for a while because they could take it with them, right? They, they had a lot of people to help them dig huge tombs and, you know, they were buried so that they could make the journey to the afterlife with all their comforts and, you know, all their clothes and things and, uh, you know, that. But the truth of the matter is, is that there's not enough room left on the planet for all of us to be buried with our things, even if we could afford to have that happen. You know, we just, there's just too many people and too much stuff. The only solution I can think of is that if we put a big, built bonfires next to the crematoriums and then, and we got plus size urns, <laughs> then we could just sort of put it all into the, into the ur urns. And, yeah. Yeah. So we, we can't take it with us. Um, and we all, you know, as part of that, we, we all were, somehow we've inherited, you know, we're genetically predisposed to have a hunter-gatherer gene, right? It's just part of the human genome. We're hunter-gatherers. We never got a gene for uh, dispersing and, and dispensing and getting rid of things. You know, it was... That I think that we we took a wrong turn some somewhere where we went from hunter gathering to living in in cities in agrarian societies. It it was a perfect excuse why not to hold on to things that you had hunted and gathered, because you were moving the next day to another camp and you had to carry it. As long as you physically had to carry it. That was a built-in good reason why you shouldn't uh, hoard things and save things and can't have too many possessions, right? Some, but somehow we, we, we never got that. Um, if you don't change or choose your change proactively, change is going to choose you. It, it's, uh, you know, we got two choices. You either decide kind of how you want to craft your life and design it, or you kick the can down the road, you kind of ignore and think that you know you can go on and on for, for quite some time. And all yeah, and in many cases that's true until something happens. You know, somebody, you know, classic is somebody breaks a hip, then suddenly life changes in an instant. You know, they, they go from being in the house, that little cocoon of the house where nothing was ever going to change, and suddenly, because no preparations were made, they're in an assisted living facility because that's the only choice. So ch choosing change proactively. Um, time horizon. Uh, one of the uh, – all, all people do this, but we – however we're wired, we, we somehow think 
that when we're making decisions, we're just kind of making them for the next day or the next year or so. I, I chuckle all the time when uh, millennials talk about buying their forever home at, at age 32, right? They, it's a lovely concept and they're probably paying over a million dollars for it. So I get the idea of them wanting it to be their forever home, but they're not. So what, what about five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years down the road? What about kids? What about job? You know, there are all the uh, kinds of other things that are going to happen in their lives. And the, uh, the it's a rarity that that's going to be their forever home. Things are going to change. And for for us in this generation, there's a difference between when you're in your 60s and when you're in your 70s. There's a difference between 70s and 80s. My mom's 97, and I can absolutely tell you there's a difference between your 80s and your 90s. And so a lot of times when we're doing this uh, mapping and trying to figure out the plan and, you know, come up with a you know clear picture of it, if if we're not thinking about time horizon, it's not going to work very well. And I think I was talking to somebody earlier. I, I I'm noticing now that as that swath of baby boomers is kind of moving through the age thing and getting you know some of them are 77 now. I'm coming across more instances where one of the biggest fears that are that's driving the downsizing uh, decisions is the fear of a loss of a spouse and one of this one spouse having to do this all on their own at some point not too long in the future and that that doesn't come up so much for people in their 60s but as we know as we move forward suddenly it's it's a more just like that we we look at the obituaries and suddenly we're seeing a whole lot more people that we knew know or knew right it just comes comes right along with it and um so time horizons uh we're all creatures of habit we love our routines that's 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 who we are and the the center place for those routines most of them revolve around home you know, all the little rituals that we do throughout throughout our day, you know, they're a lot of them are connected with home. So, how many self help books are there on the shelves today about how to how to change your habits? You know, whether it's eating this, you know, uh, you know, losing weight, all those things. It's about habits and the struggles that we have to change our habits, and for better or for worse, our homes our lifestyles, our habits. And there's a lot that's great about that, that gives us comfort and security and and that privacy and that sense of well-being. There's, you know, a lot, a lot of that comes from habits. But, um, you know, what happens when it's time to change? We struggle with anything that means changing our, our routines. To that point, you know, I raised my kids, my daughter, saying, People form habits and habits form lifetimes. And we are a product of our habits. You either have a habit of brushing your teeth and making the bed every morning, or you have you don't have that habit. Your your thinking becomes habitual. And your thinking drives your beliefs. Your all your thoughts are a product of your belief system. And and you, your belief system is uniquely yours. And no, no one's gonna change it, it's embedded in you. But your beliefs drive your behaviors and your behaviors drive your results. So if you believe that you're going to stay fit and strong and happy forever, you're going to continue to take actions on that belief. And the outcome is going to be eventually you're going to have some kind of decline. So the thing that we advocate is look deeply into your belief system. You know, if you believe assisted living is a terrible thing because growing up it meant a nursing home with a horrible shower curtain and six beds and all that. Well, it's not like that. It's like a palace. And so by changing your belief system about where, how you want to see the end of your life, you'll change some of your actions and your outcome will be better. So we encourage you to look deeply into your beliefs and where did they originate and are they still valid? And could you change your beliefs to get better outcomes? Because your beliefs drive your behaviors and your behaviors 
determine your outcome. So look deeply at where some of these long held beliefs came from because they may not be serving you. And that, that's kind of where where that how, how many people here have had some relatively recent experience or or are going right now through this or will know they'll be doing this soon where they're caring for an elderly parent? You know, I it, you know, or maybe had to take care of their affairs or it, you know, that's a you know, our parents never stopped teaching us. That's what they did from the moment we were born. And that's what they do until the moment that they die is they 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 inform, give, inform and give us an example of, hey, this is what life looks like 20 or 30 years down the road. Not It's not always pretty. Uh, and it's a struggle in many ways, but it's also an opportunity for us to look and observe, see what where their belief systems took them and where they struggled because of them. And then we we can use that information as learning to re rewrite our own uh, chapter going forward. Um, so as as humans, we all fear change. We all fear loss of control. Is one of the biggest things. And I would say the ultimate loss of control is death. And so though that's on a we fear change. We fear loss of control. We we fear death. And those things are hard. So we never talk about them in our culture. And an interesting thing, which I'm becoming more and more aware of, is that probably all of us have some significant first world problems. You know, we're, we're you know, oh, compared to many other places and cultures in the world, we, we have a lot. You know, we have a lot to be thankful for. We take a lot of things for granted that... Um, you know that that a lot of other people don't have and you know part of growing up in that generation of economic growth and credit cards and being able to buy things you know it, it we got used to a certain number of comforts and we don't like the idea of giving anything up that we have or it's the first or you know, the dispersing or, cycle. Or dispersing, yeah. It's 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 uncomfortable. We don't like it. We we're used to we made a nice life. We don't want to give any of it up. We don't want to give any of it back. And that's that becomes an impediment, you know, that the not being able to let go of the, of stuff or other aspects of your life to facilitate change in other ways becomes a, a real difficult hurdle to, to get over for a lot of us. You know, can we talk about that? The, the one big change that's fascinating that we see with our parents, they grew up, it was because they only lived to be maybe 70, 72, right? So the goal for people born in the 20s was to save up some money to leave it for the kids. And the kids are 70 now. Right. So they're starting to see, wait a minute, they don't need it at 70. They're established or not. So there there's this huge wealth transfer happening. So the, the baby boomers are leaving money to these to the millennials so they can have a home and start a life. That's a cultural change. You don't hear so much anymore about leave it to my kids. They want to give it to their grandkids now. They want to see their children in a comfortable home. So that's a, a cultural shift. But what Tom's kind of leading to is the idea that when you spend a lifetime and you form the habit of saving and being responsible and building a nest egg, what day do you decide to divest yourself of that nest egg? When do you say, woohoo, I'm taking a cruise or I'm gonna buy a Ferrari or I'm gonna, you know, because we've become accustomed, we form the habit that responsible people save and good people have a nest egg. And that shift to releasing that money either on yourself or your kids or a charity or a cause, that's a really big one. That's, we find people bump up against that all the time. They they look again at the 50 yard line or the 60, the 70 to 80 yard line and they say, I've got 15 years left and I've got X amount of money, but they can't let it go. And so they deprive themselves of good times or helping their kids or taking a cruise or buying a car, whatever their dream was, because that belief system tells them I'm irresponsible if I spend this money. So that's another thing to look at in your own in your own matrix is well, when will you give yourself permission to have some fun or donate or care for your kids with the money that you've been responsible and saved? It's really it's so much harder than one would think. 
well, that's kind of like we work all of our lives to to get to a place where we can retire and or whatever that means and then we really can't we can't let go of that right yeah we're we're human beings we're full of contradictions right um so i have a good news bad news thing that's part of this is the good news is we're all living longer and that's kind of the bad news too is we're all living longer right if you can so you can kind of look at that you know either way or both ways or uh, and then there's there's a kind of a convenient truth too, which I keep coming back to with when we work with people who are really stuck in their process and just can't get through the inertia and you know they can't get rid of their stuff and they you know they just become overwhelmed. The convenient truth is all of us sitting here have gone through major life transitions before consistently throughout life you know we all we all grew up we all got married we all got um had kids and none of those experiences did did we know exactly how they were going to turn out right we couldn't predict them there wasn't there wasn't an exact plan for how it was going to be when you had a kid you know we just got to a place where we were well enough informed that we felt comfortable to make the leap into the unknown right so we've all we've done it many times you know we so if we we've done it many times we can do it again it's just that that step into this unknown is when it comes across our increased fear of change fear of loss of control fear of death you know that 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 becomes harder when we were immortal back in our 30s you know that th these things didn't, didn't come up very often so do you want to say some more about that or uh, I, I wanted to no. talk about the big problem the biggest problem which is which one expanding track yeah yeah that's what I was leading to yeah Sorry. yeah go ahead okay yeah. so yeah. all of this stuff if you were going to summarize it uh, and kind of tie it up into just like a, a small big concept is you're you're on this planet for 90 years 95 years and we spend the first two-thirds of our lives and everything in our lives is getting bigger it's expanding it's growing it's getting larger you know our bodies are growing up we're, we're you know getting taller we're learning more we're taking you know take having more life experiences we're emancipating from home we're you know becoming our own person we're having a family you know we're so we're growing we're we're making more money we can buy more things we can start putting away money into our nest egg for the future and that's growing over time we get a house we get a bigger house we get a better job we're making more money so that's what we're doing for for the first two thirds of our lives and then we come to this place that we're kind of on the cusp of now and it's a total paradigm shift and then like a mind-altering thing because suddenly everything that was expanding is suddenly contracting and how do we when we're so used to everything getting more and bigger and expanding in our lives how do we wrap our heads around the idea that you know our, we can't do as much as we did before i'm not as mobile uh you know i i don't have as much energy uh i retired and you know i'm not as important as i as i used to be in the in the world you know i had a uh, had a big job in a big place uh, our kids have left the house uh, so you know their family's getting smaller they're far away now all of those things start to contract you know, one of the hardest is you spent 60 plus years uh, establishing your nest egg you know working hard to do that and then suddenly one day you're not working 
and you're no longer putting money in, in making that nest egg bigger, you're starting to pull out of that and the nest egg is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. What a, I mean, that's a scary thing. And there's, there was, there's no preparation for this. You know, nothing else in our lives that, that went before that is, uh, it can, can, can really make us ready for this weird transition and shift. And so the part of, part of creating a map is figuring out a way to embrace, uh, embrace, um, not, not expanding. What, what's, you know, the, what are the, um, well, simplify. But the other, you know, the other thing, sorry, that, that that's important right here, and where we come in is getting rid of the big home. Is that's a huge one because that's emblematic of everything you've accomplished. You're living in this beautiful home. You've decorated it. You love it. You love the way the light comes in the window, and letting go of that home is difficult. And that's why when Tom said we think we're going to talk about comps and all this stuff, no, we're talking about how do you relinquish the attachment the identity of this big home and how can you find peace and tranquility in the idea that you're going to simplify and i can tell you with 100 percent certainty that when you have liberated yourself from those responsibilities you're happier we have never called had anyone ever call us when they did make those shifts it's a this is terrible. I miss paying bills. I miss calling the gardener. <laughs> I really loved it when my plumbing went out, right? <laughs> the, the simplicity is suddenly they're overwhelmed with the idea. Of what, and what do we hear often? Why didn't we do this sooner? We're having a ball. We're traveling. Where the kids are dealing with responsibility. We are liberated. And so that's another thing we want to shine a light on is how to make it through that stuck place and get to the other side where your life is simpler, you're freer, you're closer to being 20 when you're that liberated than you'll ever be in this giant house, you know. So, but it's the emotional stuff that interests us, how people get stuck in that, because giving up your nesting is super scary. Yeah, why, gosh, I don't want to go golf this weekend. I'd rather stay home and mow the lawn and, and, <laughs> and fix, fix the trees in the back quarry. Yeah, that's yeah, that's Bernard, right? <laughs> um, so, so here we are. We're on the cusp of this. How do we create this? The, you know, uh, downsizing is such an inadequate word for for any or and all of this. You know, it's what it, what do you? You know, recently I've been calling it the, the third act. You know, we're we're trying to write the story of our own third act. And we've already written the story of our first two acts. You know, all those other words just don't really do it justice. And they all sound like a diminishment uh, as, as, as a life with, with less. And it doesn't have to be, you know, as long as we're willing to make the changes. You know, what we see is, that, you know, people struggle with those changes. They're, they're, they have trouble giving up some of those things that that were expansive and that just doesn't fit if they're also trying to downsize at the same time Maybe so ask some questions. yeah ask some questions you know like i'm thinking how many of you know you're stuck does anybody know they're stuck oh, and yeah. <laughs> and you know is it stuff or is it the letting go you know do you, does anybody want to share a little bit about what they're What's holding them up? Where they? What is the, the the gap between where you want to be and where you are? That's what stress is. Stress comes from the gap between where you want to go and where you are, and the inability to see how to get there. That's what causes stress. It's like and where to go? You know, it's like there is no really unless you go to a facility where they're going to take care of everything. Yeah, there is nowhere to go that there's not responsibility and you can go if you have this beautiful home and you want to go to a condo there's still stuff at the condo 
Mm-hmm. Well, yes, we. I, I wish I could promise you all a life totally free of responsibility, but at least <laughs> you have some choices what you can eliminate and how much you can yeah. cope with. And that's everybody's personal choice is I can cope with paying the HOA fees. I can't cope with somebody telling me I can't have a blue pot on my porch. You know, everybody has their threshold. But in general, you know, and and maybe you want to move to a bigger house. We're not saying that you have to do any of it, but the idea is to – we see so many people in kind of a pained emotional state because this they're living in the gap between where they are and where they want to be, or at least where they know they need to be, but they're not ready to get there yet. And that causes this dynamic tension for people. And so we're just, we would really like to be able to see a way that it became more unified. In your 60s, you do this. In your 70s, you do this. In your 80s, you do this. Because if you're if you're Arnold, well, I don't know who, Jacqueline, or you could be 90 and be perfect, and you're the lucky one. But for most of us, each decade brings a certain set of challenges, you know. And so if we if we're outing it and we're talking about it, we can help one another, you know, because there's so much wisdom in this room. I bet there's amazing stories in this room. But we don't we don't have an opportunity to share that much. Yeah. When when you're the, does anybody think that uh, they're going to have more energy and resources to <laughs> or to or to deal with this five years from now or ten years from now than they do now? Uh, you know, it's there's a certain you know, what we see unfortunately a lot. You know we. Are the, are the people who waited too long. You know, they thought about it, they thought about it, they thought about it, they couldn't get past some of these trade-offs, and then suddenly it's too late. And I, I saw that with my own parents, and, and, you know, they just waited too long, and they at a certain point in time they had, they just didn't have the energy um, and the will, they, they weren't physically well enough to go through that, that process. So I, one phrase we have written on the back, uh, blackboard back there by Bernard is, you know, uh, I'll never be younger than I am today. Right? So, you know, so an obvious question is, what's another one of those questions, Bernard? What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Yeah, I mean, it's... We're, we're waiting, hopefully, to try and figure this out so we feel more comfortable taking that step into the unknown. But it's, it's hard, yes. How do you convince a parent who doesn't believe those things that you're talking about, who is stuck in total denial of, I'm going to be fine until I'm 100, and then I'll just drop dead? <laughs> well... <laughs> That's a very common fantasy. I mean, that's the thing I've been talking about all night is when you're you're still making dinner, you're still chimming the wisteria, you're still getting on a ladder, and it just is inconceivable that you're going to get more fragile. It just doesn't seem possible because you feel so great. In your 50s and 60s, you still feel pretty great. I mean, you know, you maybe don't do the twist like you did, but you still feel good. Your mental energy is sharp. You're taking on new things. You're learning stuff. You're doing things. It just doesn't seem possible that you're going to get fragile. Intellectually, you look around and intellectually, you know, and you do the math again at night when you're laying in bed and okay, I got 20 good summers. Yeah, I feel great. This is great. And you kick the can down the road. But it, it takes a collective awareness and a collective acknowledgement that we're going to need some help in our 80s and 90s. And we want to simplify while we're still in charge, while we're still in control, while our adult kids are not going to make those decisions for you, because that's what happens if you become incapacitated or diminished enough, your adult kids will step in and they will make decisions for you that they think are in the best interest of you. But we hear lots and lots of sidebars where, oh, my kids are making me do this and I don't want to do it, you know, so if you take charge, then you have an opportunity to set your own course. You know, do your That's own even thing. assuming that you have adult kids who are in a position to be helpful, help and care, or, or are close enough to to do that. I, you know, in some ways, you know, it it's, reminds me of uh, my my own parents. Is at a certain point in time, I think you, you just 
in all their stubbornness and denial, uh, the weird thing in that is a, it's a gift to us to be able to see what that looks like. And I, I can't imagine that you haven't said to yourself, I'm not going to put my that burden on my own children or child. Right? I, so it's one of, you know, that was the gift from your mom was was to show you what that, that looked like. But there's there's no easy way to convince, you know, they've, they've cultured these belief systems for 90 years. We're not going to step in in year 95 and change their belief system. So you just have to do the best you can. What about a hypnotist? Yeah, it may be, yeah, or life regression therapy. Or, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, you know, we're willing to entertain any idea that makes it easier. But, but really, this is about our generation and how we can set the bar for the for the so that the millennials see, oh, that, okay, this is this is how you exit. That's what I'm going to do, and they add it to their list of rituals. You know, we don't have as a culture, we don't have a lot of rituals around this at all. I when during the Great Recession. <laughs> That's kind of a circuitous route, but at one point I thought I wanted to be a funeral director because I had a flower shop and I saw how terrible funerals were. And I thought, this is a, a you know, passing out of the world and losing consciousness is a huge existential interesting thing. So I thought, well, I'm going to be a funeral director. So I worked at Pacific Garden Chapel for a while to be, do intensive research on this, which is why I've always been fascinated with aging. And it was shocking. I mean, people lost people and they just went about their business. There was no room for grieving. You know, people didn't really talk about it, their friends. And you hear people say, oh, my mom passed away. And you oh, I'm so sorry. And then you go right on to the next subject. Our culture doesn't really have a place to herald that person or to, to bring them back annually. Like, the, you know, in the Hispanic culture, they have Dio de los Muertos, where you honor the past, you honor your ancestors, you remember them, you laugh about them. You, our culture doesn't have anything like that. And that, that bothered me. And that's what kind of drove me into this whole inquisition about aging and how we don't do it very well in our culture, how we don't honor our ancestors and remember on whose shoulders we've come, you know. So that that's part of what I think our job is as a generation to shift that, to shift that narrative a little bit and to, to remember. I think part of what Wait, happened. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I have a question. For both of us who are stuck and already to make that transition, where are these um, places that are walkable, affordable on a fixed income, uh, uh, quiet in a beautiful place like Santa Cruz, uh, and you know, a bit and create community for the you know, on these streets. Where are they? They're in, they're in Iowa. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are. I mean, this is the other thing. This is. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm oh. sorry. Yeah, here. You. you asked it so eloquently. Right. For those of us who are ready to downsize, who are not stuck, and who are, in fact, don't even have a lot of stuff, we're ready to do this. Um, Get up here. <laughs> <laughs> but where are these places that are walkable, that are, you know, not requiring us to be constantly dependent on a car that are in, involve uh, giving us community and um, beautiful setting and all on one level so we don't have stairs. You know, where are these places? Jose um, Avenue. Excuse me? Jose Avenue. Jose Avenue. There, there are, I mean, in, in, I mean there's, there's three or four different places in Santa Cruz. The challenge is affording and when you're downsizing. I mean, Santa Cruz is expensive. And so we encourage people to look outside of California. I mean, California's tax problems, it was expensive. You know, there's a lot of things to consider. Tom and I have driven around to look at other communities that people might want to live in. And there's beautiful places all over the United States. You just have to find your people. And I always say, go to the grocery store. Go to the grocery store where you're thinking of moving because you'll know immediately if those are your people. And if they don't have chai on the shelf or they don't have quinoa, they're not your people. If you know it's all Rice Krispies and and spam, uh, those are probably not your people. So the grocery store is like the great watering hole, and you go and you check out the grocery store in a community you might want to live in, see if it feels comfortable. If these are people you want to be around, and there are beautiful places all over the United States, and there is a little bit of an exodus out of California. They're going to Nashville. 
They're going to Texas. They're going North to Carolina. Florida, North, North Carolina. Carolina. Yeah, but you don't get any electricity in Texas. Well, I mean, the, I, I'm not an advocate for any particular city, but I'm just saying, again, it's about your belief system. If you believe you can only be happy in Santa Cruz, it's going to be difficult to downsize. So if you expand your horizons and say, you know, I'm going well, to take a little road trip. Tom, Tom and Terry, we'll find that place, right? Well, uh, or, no, or you find a way to age in place in a way that can make you happy, too. There are different solutions, but all of them involve trade-offs and change that, you know, in some cases, that's bigger than in other. You know, if you've, if you've already got your stuff handled, you're, you've made a huge <laughs> dent, dent in the in the process, but you know part of the process, and I have it up here, is you know this figuring out this map. It it, it is figuring out how do you you know if you've got a three thousand square foot house on the non ocean side of the freeway and you've lived in it for thirty years, and really what you want is a little twelve hundred square foot bungalow single level. Uh, close to the beach, uh, that walkability, you don't have to have an ocean view, but just walkability, flat, you know, close to community and, and things. Guess what? In Santa Cruz, those things, you, what you, whatever you can sell that 3,000 square foot house is, is what it's going to cost you to buy the, buy the little one. And part, so part of this research, part of figuring this map out is coming to terms with some of the realities of, you know, uh, we've had a, we haven't had any growth in 30 plus years where we've, there's no inventory, there's no more room to build things except to densify downtown. That's, so that's part of the research that, that you, that you have to sift through. That's not, that's not something that you can change in the big picture. It is something that you can change your own positioning to so a willingness to consider other options you know sometimes it's you know i'm never going to live in a condo because i hate homeowners associations well for i i get it but you know does that outweigh all the other considerations of why you might want to move down into a smaller place in a you know you you Part of what we learned when we were going through all these transitions was you never made a transition. You never got something without having to make some trade-offs. You know, if you took that job promotion and and moved to a different city, well, guess what? You you had to leave your friends. You know, you had to maybe your kids had to shift schools and it was uncomfortable and, and wasn't a great experience. But you you weighed those the balances. Uh, between those things and you made a choice the only other you know the uh, outside of that the, the, and what many people do is they can't decide and they really don't want any trade-offs and they can't sacrifice the, those things they feel strongly about it, so they do nothing and then five six seven eight years down the road change swoop life swoops in and, and changes everything for them all at once rather than them having you know come to terms with some of those you know trade-offs along, along the way it's a fascinating i mean this is what makes it so hard the other thing too is that oh hang on i just gonna say that we're changing the culture a little at a time now when i started in the business 20 years ago a downstairs bedroom wasn't a thing it's a total thing now. First thing that people walk in and they do, is there a downstairs bedroom? Because I want to retire. I want to age in place in this house I'm moving to. And if there's not a downstairs bedroom and bath, I'm out. It, either it's because they don't want upstairs because of their knees or they just know I want to be the downstairs bedroom. So part of why I think it's important that we're more vocal is we'll influence builders. If they're at a cocktail party and they hear everybody saying, I want a downstairs bedroom, then they're going to go home and scratch their head and say, oh, I get it. They want a downstairs bedroom. We see transition spaces for offices are key that was never a thing i mean maybe a home office was sort of a euphemism for the third bedroom but now i mean they want a dedicated office space so the culture does change and the builders do make accommodations and uh communities that have built walking paths around the homes that they're buildings because they know people want to walk but they're always lagging because it takes a long time for the culture to get vocal enough for the builders to do it so there's We'll probably not reap the rewards, but we're the ones that are going to be vocal enough to say, this is what we want in our homes. We don't need some of the things that you're putting in, you know, and and there are and we'll talk about it more in the next 
thing, but there's ways to make your home a little more friendly if you want to stay in it. So you, there's things that make it easier to navigate, but are not expensive to change. Yes. You know, just, just to build on what you're saying, I think before we get to the map, we need the compass. And, and your belief system is that compass. And I don't think we spend enough time reflecting on what truly is our belief system. What do we truly value? My mom never leaving her house. It's just not happening because she loves that place. Her belief system has been so ingrained. That, that is her home, and she's going to die there. Well, it, but, and you work with that, yeah. right? Now, I could try to change it. Not gonna You're happen, not going right? to happen. But, but making that belief system overt, reflecting on it, having the discussions, then we can build the map that you're saying. Mm -hmm. that, that says, OK, what's the next step? So I've got to think about, it. OK, how do I help her age in place? How do I make sure that she get up and down those stairs? She does have stairs. How do I make sure she can get out of her recliner and all those things? Right? But I think we don't spend enough time reflecting on the beliefs. No, we don't. We yeah. don't. And then those discussions hopefully take place earlier in time. One would hope. Yes. Be, be, you know, before the, it's past that point of no no return. I, you know, I'm thinking about it for our generation. One of the things that happens is happened in the 50s is is families began to spread out you know so in, in you know in the early part of the century probably it wasn't unusual to have two or three or four generations of, of family living in the same house and we're circling back there now that's really fascinating yeah. uh we used to kind of tease italian europeans because they'd have three generations in the same house and think god they can't afford their own house now we're saying why the heck should you go out and spend your own you know Three different people have Comcast, water, power, PG&E. Why don't we all put under one roof? And we see the demand for family compounds and, and dual agency, uh, dual generational housing. And I love that because Americans have come to realize the value of family proximity. They want to see their grandkids on a daily basis. They don't want it to be an annual trek. They want to have their kids here. And there's a lot of kind of a re uh, renaissance in the American family reuniting which is really lovely to see how much cohesion there is you know yes so we need housing that will accommodate that what's that we need housing that yes will accommodate yeah yes. yeah and the challenge is talking about bedrooms on the first floor how about two master suites so two elders well it would be lovely if we had the land santa cruz is super but challenged exactly but you're talking about maybe not in california and not in santa cruz yeah but to be able to not have to live alone. Yeah. Live well, alone. Marika is working on co-housing because I have been a big advocate. One of the biggest demographics is single women over 75. They've lost their partner. They're living alone. There's one woman in a 3,000 square foot house. She's paying all that electricity and part, uh, home insurance, all that stuff to sit there by herself, rather isolated. When six houses down, there's somebody in the same boat. But that whole, that belief system thing of, well, I'm independent, I need to live alone gets in the way and I have had women that did co-house together and loved it coming home to someone coming home to soup on the stove how was your day totally enlivened their life rather than sitting there watching CNN or Fox News alone and so Marika and I have been yeah yeah, yeah 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 all of that younger families that also struggle with time housing. So th these are the things we want to explore. How can we change our concept of what it is to, to be, what is housing? Is it, It's not just a roof over your head. It's a, a can be a convivial, wonderful place to, to yes. Well, part of the thing for me, thinking about some kind of guide to explore some alternatives in the county, I, the it was driving me a little crazy when it was the slide that you had on there because we just went through a major septic system project oh. where the men do the work in the mud and the rain <laughs> stuck in those boots you know for a couple of months and, and trying to go to the next step getting the place ready for us to be able to it would make a big difference in terms of what we'd be able to 
sell the place for. Right. Sure. But then once you sell it, then where do, where you, do you go? Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, I, there is no ready solution for that. We live in a, the, the, we're the second smallest county in the state of California. Our land mass is teeny tiny. Some of it's, you know, sand. I mean, there's just no easy solution for that problem, except to say, change your belief system that this is the only place where God made a, a mark. Santa Cruz is not the only beautiful place in our United States. There's beautiful places with lovely people, but you have to challenge your belief system and be willing to experiment because you could have a, a really comfortable life in a big house for half of what you had. What you sold your house here for, you could buy twice the house for half the money in almost any state in the union. It's I'll, really I'll shocking. Be, uh, take a guess at who who is selling uh, homes that are on the market now. Who, who, what's the profile of the people selling? Well, in my neighborhood, they're all older people that want out of the you know want to downsize. Thank you. Know, younger people from over the hill coming over. Eighty percent of the houses that are for sale are people that are older that are trying to figure out this downsizing thing, and the vast, vast majority of them are are going elsewhere, either elsewhere in California or elsewhere out of California. And eighty percent of the people that are buying here are coming from elsewhere. So there's, you know, we've got this. You know, I call it invasion of the body snatchers, which is, you know, you, you wake up one morning and that neighbor you've had for 20 years has been replaced by someone that sort of looks kind of, kind of like they did 20, 30 years ago, but it's not them. So, you know, we're, this is the housing crisis and, and it's, it's exacerbated by the fact that we're all getting older. There, there have, has been no provision made you know, we didn't expect to be living this long and Santa Cruz didn't expect along the way to have these needs. And guess what? It didn't stay the same as it was in the 60s and the 70s. And yes, our, our uh, you know, many of our kids who grew up here can't afford to come back. You know, an interesting thing that's that's changing a lot is we have parents who uh, would really, really, really desperately like to be near their kids and grandkids. and But their kids and grandkids can't afford to move back to Santa Cruz. So more, we're getting more and more calls from people that are that want to buy a family compound in, in Santa, somewhere in Santa Cruz County because they've already got their equity here and it would afford a chance for their kids to move back to Santa Cruz and then hopefully provide some care and things as, as the aging process went through. So there's a lot of those discussions happening and you know, even even things like it's it's easier to build an APU than it was, still hard and still costly, but it's it, there's been some progress and you know so something like that or a junior ADU within your house which is much easier you know can provide a, a, a space for uh, a multi-generational um, living situation or or a caregiver for that matter I call them butlers and maids rather than caregivers yeah. people people say they don't I don't want a caregiver but it's, wouldn't it be lovely to have a butler and a maid bring you toast and tea in the morning and then suddenly go oh yeah that's not so bad that doesn't sound so terrible in Hawaii they call them auntie yeah 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 it's a nice it's a yeah, nice change the name for it and does anybody else have a have a suggestion for what what's what's the name for this what's a better name than downsizing or right old, sizing elderhood or elderhood elderhood is better than older yes <laughs> yeah uh, what is it adventure yeah adventure <laughs> adventurehood adventure. why don't we call it adventurehood i like that yeah yeah liberation <laughs> it is liberating i mean i wish i could impart on you all the voices in my head of the people who have sold big houses or or just changed houses or brought their kids with them but they made a conscious choice in their life and they made a change and they're happier on the other side being stuck in that delta between i'm not where i want to be and i can't get where i want to be that delta is 
it's like having one foot in the bathroom and one foot in the bedroom uh, straddling the hall and you can't close either door you're just stuck until you take that leap of faith tom talked about so, yeah, okay. that, that isn't what we worked all our lives for that was never the plan right i like their third act <laughs> third act's not too bad yeah yeah because yeah. you can kind of third act because i i think we're writing this is a chance generationally to write the story because no one's ever been there before we never had a time where people are going to live as long as we are. So it's it's like a, you know we can we can we can write that story, our own story. So next week we'll talk about some fundamental stuff, and we're going to have the CPA come. Yeah, we're going to so we're going to dig into some of these. Uh, I mean, how many people are particularly concerned about Prop 19 issues, property tax transfers? We'll talk, we'll talk about that next Wednesday. It's that, about transferring your property That's tax. one of those asset-based uh, decision things that has to do with being able to uh, transfer your existing property tax to a, to another property within California. Which is that's gone through some changes. How about capital gains? Um, yeah, so we'll, we're going to have a, a CPA here next week who will kind of go through basis adjusted basis you know how how to how to look at that and think about it and plan for it uh i'm going to talk a bit about so that the question about how do you go from that more expensive house to a smaller house how do you make that transition how do you buy something and sell something at the same time do you do you buy the new thing first and then sell your thing do you sell your house first and then try and buy something but there's no inventory, so what does that look like? How do you how do you do both at the same time? There's some financing mechanisms that can help people uh, make that transition as well. Um, you know, I I know uh, reverse mortgages is one of those things that uh, gets people's higher up. You know, uh, uh, Tom Selleck uh, I think oversold it. Uh, uh, you know, twenty. We should talk about that though, because next week. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about some of those more technical uh, aspects, asset-based, you know, pragmatic choices, uh, and then um, and then next week after that, we're going to have some people come who work in the business of Stop. organizing, decluttering, hoarding. Yeah, you know how to how to deal with stuff and you know that that just you know to me stuff is that is the classic is the most blatant example of that difficulty between expanding for the first two-thirds of our lives and and getting smaller on in the last third of our lives our, that stuff is so hard to let go and why is that what is what is, what is that about that, that that we all know we can't take it with us we all know we're not going to be here at some point in time why is it so hard to get rid of the stuff so we're, we're gonna we deal with it all the time a house a house that's empty if you if somebody wanted to put it on the market it would take us three weeks to get it ready and on the market for somebody who's got a lifetime's worth of stuff in their house, typically that's an eight, nine, ten month process, sometimes a year to a year and a half. Yeah. And there's a funny resistance to getting help around it. We're moving this sweet, adorable couple. They're doing a double move. They're moving some of their stuff to a small place in Santa Cruz and some of the stuff to Virginia, where one of their children live. And this is their home of 23 years, so it's emotional. And um, I said to them, they were getting down to the wire and it, I could see there were miles from being packed up and ready to go. And the moving truck was scheduled. I said, please let me get somebody to help you pack. No, I can do it myself. I said, okay. You know, then I went back a couple out there getting a little more tired and the stairs, it's getting a little rickety going down the stairs, carrying a big bundle of linens. I said, please let me get, it took three days of begging before they would allow me to have somebody that you'll meet come and help. I saw her tonight and they were sitting having dinner on a little teeny tiny TV tray with two stools and the entire house was packed up. And she said, oh, God bless you for getting me to bring that person in because, you know, it's an infusion of energy, but we resist these things because 
we are that generation of I can do it myself. And yet it made all the difference in her last day of packing to have that professional person who was much better at helping her throw things away and say, when was the last time you used this basil? Uh, like three years ago? You know, it, you need a coach around it. So we'll talk about some of those kinds of things uh, when we get together again. Can I have a sale here? Can I have a sale? <laughs> what? Can I use this building to have a sale? Oh. The right sale. Yeah, 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 that's a, we're going to have it a state sale. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 All, all the things I'm going to put on yeah. Craigslist. Oh, I'm just going to drag it out front and put a free sign on it. <laughs> no, you put $25 on it and leave it alone out there, and then it'll go right. away. You know? Well, my friend is going to, maybe they'll come and pick some. My kids want it. They just want me to store it for them until they're ready uh, for them. It, it's valuable. How can I give it away? It, it's a, it's stapled there. Uh, other, uh, I mean, are, are there chords that we haven't hit or touched on here? Are there? Well, I just have one thing, and that is like, uh, if, if you're in a house that's one story, which is perfect for retirement, and um, but and you want to stay in Santa Cruz because you have been here for 40 years and you have all these friends, you don't really want to lose that. The people in my neighborhood have aged in place and like in their 90s, but they have children that come by every day to help them out in some way or caregiver and and a character, not just for and a character come by. But how can you stay in your house if you don't think it's a good idea to move? You know, I mean what other kind whatever things can you do to to enable yourself to stay there's there you know there's a variety of aging in place things there's a contractor we could bring in who does a lot of uh, chain physical changes to the structure it's you can create uh, spaces with a junior adu within your house for for a caregiver or or you can actually trade rent for for some uh, services from from that people there's you know there's a you can think of there's a variety of creative ways to think about that every one of them is going to involve some level of trade-off. Yeah. The thing I worry about most is that person who has a um, million dollars worth of equity in their house gets to a place where suddenly they need, there's an emergency. How do you get the equity out of your house? If, if all of your nest egg is in your, your four walls and under your roof, uh, Guess what? You can't just go down to the bank and tell them you got a million dollars worth of equity and have them give you a loan. That do it doesn't work that way anymore. And pretty much about the only way you can stay in place and do that, do that is to get a reverse mortgage, which it, which people almost across the board loathe the reputation of. So, uh, but I think that's, yeah, I think it's a good tool for some people, not for others. So, I mean, there are a lot of this, each of us is different and some of these questions will be slightly different and, you know, there'll be some possible solutions that sound good to some and, you know, are, are awful to others, but, you know, it's getting this, exploring each of these things, that's, that's important. Uh, there was a, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say that, uh... So I feel like you, like I'm ready, right? Um, but here in Santa Cruz County, we really haven't stepped up for the over 55 active, blah, blah, blah. Like Jimmy Buffett, of all people, has one of the best retirement villages I've ever seen. He has um, two of them in Florida and one in South Carolina. And I went to see the one in South Carolina and beautiful homes, high quality, really good partnerships, little village in the middle of it. Everyone has a golf cart. You're driving around, you have a movie, you know, a music amphitheater and stuff, but you're in South Carolina. But anyway, when I was there looking at the houses, I, I moved from New Jersey because I love California. Now I'm going to go to South Carolina. It's like, whoa. You know? So, but 
uh, while I was there, um, two women from San Cruz bought down there. They move, they're moving there. We, yeah, and, we, we had a, 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 strangely, when we moved to Asheville, she, we sold her house here and she moved to Asheville. She rented her house here for a year, lived there for a year to yeah. make sure she liked it. Called me and said, yep, I like it. Put the yeah. house on the market. So, yeah. I mean, not every foreign place is is a hellhole. You know, right. there there are some really nice places in the United States. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, but still, it's a yeah. And you know what else? I th and this is just my, my what I think might you also want to consider is when you've lived in a town for 30 years or 20 years or whatever, you kind of become immune to a lot of things. When you're in a new environment, you're more open, you're more curious, you're expansive, you might talk to a stranger, you're going to ask, hey, where's a good place to go on a Sunday? You become a different person when you move into a different locale because you're not, you don't have blinders on. You know, when you have your little routine that you've had forever, you stay in that orbit. When you're in a new environment, it forces you out of your shell a little bit. And you end up making friends and doing different things and finding new interests and stuff. There's a lot to be said for shaking things up in the third act. Well, well, and, and looking at the, the principle of applying time horizon to all things. Well, you know, my mom's 97. She doesn't have any friends left. That's it. You know, you, yeah. this, this community gets smaller and smaller and smaller, but that doesn't mean that you can't move to another community of, you know, maybe Jimmy Buffett's community. Right. I thought he was just hanging around all this time. I had no idea he was. Real estate. Uh, yeah. They're like the nicest ones I've seen. I've seen a lot of them. That's, but that's to your point. Then you have a central center where when yeah. people die or they pass away, then new people move in and right. there's a way to meet them and yeah. all activities and travel and yeah. everything. I mean, that's this is why we're we're yeah. talking about this is, you know, we're just a little seed of this change, yeah. but unless we talk about it and demand these things, it's not gonna happen because builders won't know. Builders build what builders built last week and they don't wanna change it up, so they build what they built. We need to be more vocal. We need to be more present. We need to be, you know, use our influence as the wealth holders to get what we want for because there's so many more years left, really. Yeah, I, I want to say that I think you may have more options here in Santa Cruz County than in some other places. I come from, I'm here temporarily for two months, coming from Boulder, Colorado. And I own a house with too much land around it. I can't take care of it anymore. I'm ready to downsize. But anything I would do in Boulder County now, it costs me more to downsize. <laughs> so that that house that I would sell would buy me, um, you know, a I, smaller I house. Even find something that I could afford in Boulder County that uh, with the HOA fees and everything else. But I've discovered that you have these options here in Santa Cruz County, which is a place I've always been interested in, um, that we don't have there. These 55 plus communities, like up in Scotts Valley, uh, there's a few places where they're manufactured homes, but they're all on one level. They're um, affordable. Yeah. Um, they're walking distance from certain amenities. Uh, and there's a few other things like that here that are sort of condo style options yeah. that have attracted me. I mean, this whole concept of 55 plus, we don't even have it in Colorado except extremely expensive, you know, luxurious um, uh, accommodations that um, are not af affordable to many people. So, so I was kind of curious about those options and um uh you know i don't know if you might be able to well they're an excellent that. option this yeah i'm glad you brought that up that's another thing oh, i never live in a trailer park you know it's like trailer park trailer now costs you six hundred ninety five thousand right. dollars and they're wonderful because they're they're sequestered they're you're with people that are going through similar things they're very neighborly people look out for each other take out the mail take out the trash 
I think they're an undersung virtue myself. And I, I can't imagine that they're a great option because they're still available for under a million dollars, which is amazing. They're being retrofitted constantly. Modular homes have gotten ever better. You can buy a modular home and put it in there. You know, we're not talking about the little tin can things. These are really beautiful homes, but they're a great option. And they're uh, nice and predictable. And, you know, you have to pick the right one. There's a lot of stuff we could talk about about that. But that's one of those mental constructs where you've always said to yourself, I'm never going to a nursery home and I'll never live in a trailer park. Well, why not? Things have changed. You know, it could be a perfect option. And, and I agree. There are more options. And it's, it's one of these things where you have to drill down on these pieces, get the information, and then see how that piece of the puzzle might fit into to your your larger map, one one of the things that, that you see all the time is so many people in our culture are are averse to paying taxes of any kind, and you know I I, I get that you know I, I don't like writing a check either, but I, I've seen people who are are willing to be miserable where they're at for the next 20 plus years have a crappy quality of life because they don't want to pay capital gains tax, which only comes after you've made a whole bunch of money on, on the investment of your house that you've been living in for the last 20 or 30 years. Same with Prop 19. I don't, I'm, I refuse to move because I don't want to have higher uh, property taxes. Well, Terry's giving me the time to go sign. <laughs> But she often uh, she often does the egg, the egg timer with me. Um, so I hope some of this was helpful. We're going to get into more of the, the specifics next week. With uh, uh, we've got a CPA coming to talk about capital gains at Prop 19 and uh, some of the real estate questions. And then the third week we'll we'll have yeah. we're going to devote to stuff. We can talk about stuff as as much as people want to talk about stuff. <laughs> You can bring your own stuff. <laughs> and I forgot, I actually had a uh, uh, picture. Oh, there's my garage. I wanted to show everybody my garage. You're welcome to bring before and after pictures of your garages to share with the group. So thank you all for being here. Yeah, there yeah, you go. Yeah. You can all bring your stuff over and put it in my garage. That's right. <laughs>